Good morning. How does this family of four disappear off the face of the earth? How does this family of four, a husband who's running a business, a mom who's raising her two kids, fixing up a house they just bought recently, how do they just disappear? Just up and gone. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence in this case will show you not only the how, but the why, and especially the who. The how is that each member of this family that you see here, Joseph McStay, 40 years old, his wife Summer, their two kids, <clears throat> Gianni, who was four years old, and Joe Jr., who four days before they were murdered, had just turned three. The how is that they were beaten about the head and face until they died. And then they were taken 100 miles away from their home and buried in the desert. They were buried in such a manner that animals tore at their remains, that they decomposed to almost nothing but a set of a few bones. The why boils down to a basic human emotion, something that we discussed during, during jury selection. The why boils down to greed. The why boils down to greed and greed's child fraud. And the who is sitting here in court today? Charles Mann. The who is the person who, while claiming to be Joseph's best friend, was nowhere to be found when it came to calling the police when they were missing. Didn't call it in. The who was while claiming to be Joseph's best friend, the man who, while claiming to be Joseph's best friend, was forging checks from Joseph's business and taking money from him, putting his hands in the cookie jar. The who, the evidence will show, is the person whose cell phone activity for significant portions of time during significant days and times around the time of the murder is off the grid. Nowhere to be found, when all other times, it's always found. The who is the person who desperately tried to cover his tracks after the murders. The who is the person who, <coughs> excuse me, in attempting to cover his, his tracks, the evidence will show he misled investigators, he talked in circles, and he played the victim. The who is the person who, even after the murders, took $5,000 from Joseph's mother under the guise of completing a project and never paid her back. The who, ladies and gentlemen, is the defendant. And those lies and that misleading and that talking in circles and that playing the victim worked for a time, for three, almost four years. This is the mixed days. In 2010, they lived in a town called Fallbrook. They moved into uh, the residence in November of 2009. Prior to that, the family lived for a brief period of time with Joseph's mother, Susan Blake, in the Tom's Farms area, uh, just south of Corona. Fallbrook is a town that's south of Temecula, north of Escondido, north of San Diego. They moved into the house at Avocado Vista Lane, there near the end of a cul-de-sac, into a quiet neighborhood. <clears throat> they drove two vehicles. The green Dodge you see here in the driveway of the residence, 
uh, the evidence will show it was always parked there, and typically Summer drove that vehicle. The family also owns uh, this white Isuzu Trooper that Joseph primarily drove. Joseph had a business. The business was called Earth Inspired Products. The business started, well, before 2005, and what they did is sold indoor water features. If a business needed a, wanted a water fountain inside of their business, um, <clears throat> Joseph would provide it. He started the business initially uh, with a guy named, you'll hear about, named Dan Cavanaugh. Dan Cavanaugh was a, um, a web guy, created the web page. And the business essentially was a customer would order a fountain, um, it was already made, and they would basically retail it to the customer. Um, in about 2006 or 2007, Joseph met the defendant, who fancied himself a entrepreneur, a welder, a designer. And Joseph began building custom fountains. In other words, if a business or a residence or someone wanted a particular type of fountain or style of fountain, uh, his company would build it. And he began working with the defendant. Now, the defendant owned his own business called High Design. So there were two separate ent entities of the business. <clears throat> On February 15, 2010, that was a Monday, uh, the San Diego Sheriff's Department was notified uh, of a missing persons report. That missing persons report was called in by Joseph's brother, Michael McStay who had been to the residence on the 13th, the Saturday before, with the defendant. And you're going to hear from Michael McStay, and Mike McStay is going to tell you I went, and the defendant pointed out a small crack. <clears throat> the window in the backyard was open, and that led into Joseph's study. He pointed it out and said that he had noticed it before. And no one had heard from my brother, so I went in. And I opened the front door for the defendant, and he wouldn't come in. He wouldn't come anywhere near the house. So he waited two days. He thought there was a time period you had to wait when adults go missing. And he waited a couple days, and he called the San Diego Sheriff's Department, and they arrived at the residence on the 15th. That's Monday. Deputy Tingley of the San Diego Sheriff's Department came to the residence, and took the initial missing persons investigation. What was learned was on the 10th of February, that was the Wednesday prior um, to this, uh, that a welfare check had been called in by Dan Kavanaugh from Hawaii. He also went into the residence and took some initial pictures. And you can notice from some of these pictures, there's newspapers on the floor, Drawers are out. <clears throat> this is looking down the stairway. To the left here is going to be the kitchen. To the right is going to be the, the living room. There's a table here and some chairs. Took some photographs of the upstairs bathroom. You'll note here on the left is a child's onesie. Um, several items of clothing on the bathroom counter. Took a picture into Joseph's study, and this is the window that Michael McStay came through when he came in. You can notice this lamp here, that will become important here in a minute. Uh, this is a photograph of Joseph and Summer's bedroom. You'll notice in the, in the photograph, this lamp is knocked over. <coughs> After taking these photographs, conducting the initial interview uh, with Michael McStay, Deputy Tingley called uh, in detectives. And two detectives from the San Diego Sheriff's Department came to the, to the residence. Um, Detective Troy Dugall and Suzanne Fisk came to the residence on that same day, on the 15th of February. What they learned through their investigation was that the last contact anyone in the family, Summer, Joseph, anyone had with anyone was on February 4th, 2010. That's a Thursday. They learned that that week, in particular, February 2nd and February 3rd, 
a friend of a mutual friend of Joseph and Summer. His name is MacGyver McGrar. His first name is MacGyver. Um, was at the residence helping them paint, um, and they learned that on February eighth, the family's trooper, the White Isuzu trooper that I showed you a photograph of earlier, uh, was towed. And it was towed from a parking lot <clears throat> right across from the United States-Mexico border in this parking lot here. San Diego Sheriff's Department um, got a hold of the tow company. They discovered that in this parking lot in this shopping center here in San Ysidro, the car was towed at about 11, 11.30 on the night of the 8th. That's Monday the 8th. They learned that um, the car could have been there as early as 7 a.m., that security really doesn't start going around uh, looking for cars that aren't supposed to be parked there any longer until after the last business is closed, which is about 9 o'clock. Uh, they noticed it. They towed the vehicle because it wasn't supposed to be parked there. San Diego Sheriff's Department uh, secured the vehicle, took it to their impound lot. Here's a photograph taken by the tow company at 11.01 on February 8th, 2011, or the security company, or the tow company. <coughs> San Diego Sheriff's Department uh, processed that trooper, including taking what they call swabs um, for biological material, particularly DNA, from the steering wheel, from the, the door handles, from the center console, from the gear shifter. Um, they did that as precaution. Again, keep in mind, they've only known about this family for a few days when all this is, is happening and they're discovering all this information. They learned that Joseph had someone by the name of Charles Merritt that had done work with him and, in fact, was at the house with Mike McStay um, two days before the missing persons report. They also learned that Charles Merritt was the one that alerted Joseph's mother on February 9th, 2010. So they went to interview Charles Merritt. This is approximately 48 hours, um, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more, after San Diego detectives have, ever, have first learned that this family even exists. So keep in mind. So they went to uh, the defendant's residence. He lived in Rancho Cucamonga at a complex uh, near Church Street, basically condos, townhomes, apartment type complex. They met with him there. He made clear that Joseph was Earth Inspired Products and that he was iDesign and that he did most, but not all, of the custom fountains that Joseph's company did. And he says the following. Joseph, Joseph, Joseph was one of my best friends, and you know, obviously, in my business associate, and that's not something I want to live with. So, detectives asked him about Joseph's relationship with Summer. He said about his wife. You love her? Oh yeah, yeah. He definitely loved her. Um, he, she's a pain in the butt. Um, he was pussy wet. Any domestic violence did you ever observe? No. Uh, Joseph was. They next asked about basic questions. Again, it's a missing persons investigation. They're still in the first two days of this how tall Joseph was and how much he weighed. Weighs. Joe, how tall is you Joseph? Shorter than me. I can actually tell you about what he weighed only because I. Did. One of these articles here said his weight was 175, but he was five, eight, I would guess. Yeah. He was, let me see. That's about five, eight, isn't it? No, he's not only five, six. So, um, okay, so now. He was, he was definitely. This is way shorter than me. 
Next, they asked about the condition of the house, if he had seen it, in particular, that light that was in Joseph's study that I showed you the photograph of. He was asked about that. But I can tell you, beyond a shadow of a doubt, I know for a fact that that light, I had never seen it off. Okay? He always, leaves, he always left it on because his kids get up in the middle of the night and they go downstairs and get water out of the, out of the refrigerator. And uh, he always left that light on and the door open so that they didn't fall down the stairs. He talked, they asked him questions about the, the children, Gianni and Joseph Jr. Always, though, no, you don't understand these kids. His, his boys were, I mean, they would get up on the kitchen. Oh, so you on YouTube. No, they're on YouTube. Okay. I saw how you That's a good word for it, you did it. They were, they were corporal punishment. No, she, she didn't believe it. She didn't believe in any kind of corporal she, I swear, she would go, stop it, stop it, stop it. And she would do that for half an hour until they lost interest in whatever they were doing. He'd go about doing something else. It was, oh, God, did it. Yeah. They asked about those vehicles that I showed you earlier, the green Dodge and the, and the white trooper, where they were typically parked. Directly in front of the house, on the street. On the street, right? Yeah. She always parked the truck in the driveway. She didn't like him parking the white car next to it because she couldn't get the kids in or out. He might be asking or wondering, why is he playing these clips? Um, and, and why did I stress, why does he keep stressing two times that the Sheriff's Department's only known about this case for less than 48 hours? Because you may have noticed something about some of those clips. You may have noticed something about his speech in those clips. This is their first contact with him. San Diego Sheriff's Department noticed. And this is what they said. And this was his response. Do you have any knowledge or information? And further. It's interesting because you know we deal with families and friends and people all the time. And oftentimes they'll we'll notify them that their loved one is in and they will still use the present tense because it really hasn't set in. And that's why I'm asking you to use the past tense a couple times, which is really unusual. Yeah. I have no idea. I, you know, I'm not sure what what I used past tense. And we in context know. with, uh, but I have no idea you why. Said, uh, you know, was my best friend. Oh. Um, I did. No one knows that they're dead. San Diego's conducting a missing persons investigation, and he's saying Joseph was my best friend. He's saying the kids were energetic. In fact, if you notice on one clip, he corrects himself and says, Joseph always leaves, Joseph always left that light on. You'll hear the entire interview, and you'll hear that he does slip in and out. Right now, behind, well, actually, right now, pretty much even. Because these two, these two projects, if you see, $173,000 is what he's paid me, $158,000 is what he owed me before these two projects came to, I owed him. $15,000, okay? With these two projects, 
then he sold him twenty six thousand. So he was he was dead now. Oh, we need a little over ten thousand. Somewhere almost eleven thousand. This is the email he provides San Diego and become important here in a little bit as well. February 1st at 1142 a.m. What he doesn't mention is he's trying to explain this to these, uh, the evidence will show, very tired detectives who've been working up two days trying to find this family, is he never mentions that the total that he owes Joseph is $42,845, not Joseph owing him $11,000. Chase paid one hundred and seventy three thousand two hundred fifty five owed one hundred and fifty eight. He's been overpaid fifteen thousand forty five dollars plus plus twenty seven thousand eight hundred dollars. He doesn't mention that when he's explaining and what he ends up saying is, well, Joseph's going to owe me eleven thousand dollars after these two projects. Because twenty six thousand minus fifteen thousand is about eleven thousand. Two days later, on February 19th, 2010, uh, San Diego Sheriff's Department secures a search warrant at the Avocado Vista residence. In the interim, a few things had happened. Joseph's mother, Susan Blake, had been to the residence and had cleaned up. Uh, Mike, Joseph's brother, had been, in his mind, he'd been given permission to take the computers out. He took the computers out. When he was told by Detective Dugall, bring them back, we had a search warrant, he brought them back. Um, so the house looks different than it did on the 15th. This is the entryway to the house. This is the uh, front room as you walk into the entryway. This is the carpet. The uh, doorway to the residence is in the upper right. There is what appears to be some kind of stain, bleach stain, on the carpet near the residence. Summer's Ugg boots, it appears, were outside on the porch. And there's sandals here. This is the kitchen area. You'll notice here by the island, half of the island has blue painter's tape. You'll notice here on this table is a calculator. And you'll notice that all of the drawers that were there when Deputy Kingley was there have been put back in. You'll notice a paint can, more painter's tape. <coughs> and this is the front room. And in the back corner of the residence is a futon. There are several items here on the kitchen counter. This is the picture of the futon. The futon appeared to be missing a cover. Evidence obtained from the state's computer shows that it had a cover. It was an off-white woven material type cover. Uh, this table, again, with the calculator, pay close attention to the evidence about this table. Again, blue painter's tape around the downstairs bathroom. A, uh, I don't know how you describe that, shaggy uh, toilet bowl cover with no accompanying floor mat. Uh, this is one of the upstairs bathrooms with newspaper, painter's tape, again, not completed. This is the <coughs> entryway into Joseph's downstairs office. There's the blinds that Mike McStay came in through, or that window. Um, across from the desk is a closet. Um, placard 16 here denotes Earth Inspired Products checks. The top check was 4245. San Diego investigators also obtained uh, a surveillance video from the neighbor across the street. Her name was Jennifer Mitchell. She said that, of course, during the initial missing persons, they're talking to neighbors, they're talking to everybody they can. She found a video, uh, something happened on the video, on her surveillance video, so she brought it to San Diego's attention. San Diego went and recovered a very small portion of the night of February 4th. Um, they, didn't, they didn't obtain all of February 4th or the days out thereafter. They just obtained a very small portion, and the rest of it doesn't exist anymore. But from that residence, what you're going to see is a video. Uh, you're going to see a car pass down the cul-de-sac. You're going to see 
Headlights turn on from the McStayer residence, which is here by the great uh, marker. You're going to see a vehicle come out and park, or not park, but hit its brakes approximately where that vehicle is there on that photograph. That's not the vehicle. This is a Google Earth image. Here's the vehicle. Draw your attention to the upper right of the screen. To the lower left, that's Ms. Mitchley's porch. And this video was from 747 on the night of February 4th. The vehicle passes. The headlights will come on. And the car hits the brakes. The initial uh, investigators initially believed this was the family's Isuzu Trooper. We'll discuss that a little bit further as we go. Well, I'll, spoiler alert, the Trooper doesn't have an exhaust pipe on the passenger side. San Diego um, detectives continued to investigate the case. Uh, there were a lot of leads that went nowhere. There was a lot of sightings of the family that didn't pan out. Uh, there was some indication the family may have gone across the border, given the location of their vehicle. Um, nothing really panned out for San Diego. They were given a certain set of facts, and those facts boxed them in. Um, at some point, they packaged up their evidence and turned it over to the FBI. And actually, that was shortly before November 11, 2013. On November 11, 2013, at a location in the high desert, in the Victor Valley area, just west of the 15 freeway, a motorcycle rider was riding his uh, dirt bike. His name is John Bluth. <coughs> To the uh, southwest of this particular freeze of the screen is a landfill, a dump. Uh, and to the right there, you can see the 15 freeway. Mr. Bluth was riding his dirt bike, and he called the police. Can you see with the transfer? How can I help you? Hi, I'm out here on a motorcycle out behind the, the dump. And it kind of looks like a human skull. Police arrived. They uh, obviously began a search. Uh, the homicide team went out and over the course of about three days, two or three days. Um, they began searching the area for any human bones or anything else. And they found two graves. It's tough to see here, right in this area. Uh, towards the top of that photograph, that's the 15 freeway where these semi-trucks are heading northbound towards Vegas on the 15 freeway. This area is depressed. You can't be seen from the freeway. You can see cars from there, but the cars can't see you. There's two graves here in this area here. You can see one in the lower left quadrant and one towards the middle, towards the top. This area here on the left of the photograph is the landfill, that's the dump. Um, this mountain to the right uh, will become important here in a little bit. On the other side of that mountain is a town called Oro Grande. And again, this is a, a, a view facing west, westbound. Uh, and these are uh, the graves here though, in the middle of the photograph, or at least one of the graves. They began the painstaking process of going through the graves. They located several items, potential evidentiary value outside of the graves, including a towel that appeared to be torn, uh, a piece of woven off-white cloth, uh, the right cup of a black bra, and in this photograph it doesn't look black. This is outside of the grave after three years. They uh, divvied them up just for organization's sake into grave A and grave B. 
In grade A was an adult male, Joseph McStay Sr. Also, along with him, was Gianni, a four-year-old. Grave A had been disturbed by animal activity, um, quite a bit of animal activity, and in fact, both of Joseph's lower bones, his lower leg bones, were outside of the grave, were located outside of the grave. <coughs> uh, there is a piece of material, and they attempt to go layer by layer as they, they do this, collecting anything or noting anything that they find. Here you can begin to see Joseph's uh, ribs there in the center of the photograph. And to the upper right, in the upper right quadrant, is his head. As they dug further, they found that he was wrapped with a white electrical cord. He also had across his uh, lower body a red, what appeared to be a tie-down strap. And he was encased in a woven-type fabric. Here you can see the red tie-down strap in the cord. To the right is his ribs and his head area. Another view of the cord and the tie-down strap. To the left here by the compass would be where his lower legs are. You can tell they're not, they're no longer attached. In grade B was Summer McStay and her baby, Joe Jude. It was not as disturbed as, as grave A, that being grave B. Um, it did have a piece of shaggy type material. As they dug deeper, they found Summer's pants and her underwear near her head. And this, is, this is her head uh, with her hair. That's a close-up view of her uh, underwear and sweats. And these sweats were unfurled at the San Bernardino County Crime Lab and had what appeared to be bleach stains on them. Also in that grave was a black backpack. And one of the boys always wore a black backpack. Inside of the backpack was a paintbrush, a pick, and a child's spoon. Mm -hmm. Paintbrush had white paint on it, and on the McStay's home computer, uh, there's a photograph of Joe Jr. holding a paintbrush that looks almost identical to that one. Also in that grave was a three-pound Stanley sledgehammer. The sledgehammer had on its handle white paint. Summer, the left cup of Summer's black bra was found under her body. She was laying face down almost on her side. The black bra had on it a white paint drip um, that's not dripping as if she was painting while standing up, but if she was on her side, the paint's dripping to the side. That paint was sampled along with the paint on the hammer by the FBI's lab. The FBI determined that it was consistent from coming from the same source, the paint on the hammer and the paint on the rock. There was also two tire tracks. There was rainy weather on February 5th, as I recall, in the high desert. There was two tr tire tracks, each set leading to the graves, and they measured 73 and 76 inches, which is not consistent with the trooper. There's the other set. The reason I say consistent with rainy, muddy weather is it had been three years, over three years, since the family went missing. The autopsies uh, were conducted along with the excavation uh, with the assistance of a forensic anthropologist by the name of Dr. Alexa Gray. She was out there collecting bones, helping with the ex excavation and her roles to figure out what bone it is, what part of the body it is, and what person it goes with male, female, child, adult. <clears throat> so the autopsies took place over the course of a number of days. Joseph McStay, Jr. 
This was all that was left of Joseph McStay Jr., the baby. The skull piece found by Mr. Bluth, several fragments and three rib bones, one of which, this middle one, was found in the grave with Summer. Also in the grave with Summer was a diaper and a cell phone case. Gianni McStay, these are his remains. No clothing was found for Joseph Jr. A pair, only a pair of shorts was found that was associated with Gianni. This is a, a view of Gianni's skull showing fracture along the suture that a child has in their head. He died of multiple blunt force impacts to the head. He had multiple skull fractures, each side in the back and in the front. Autopsy was performed by Dr. Shanikar and Shang Tree of the uh, San Bernardino County Coroner's Office. This was another impact site on Gianni's skull. Summer McStay, what you're looking at here is all that remains of Summer McStay. Essentially, um, several pieces of skull, her jaw, um, the clothing here is on the upper part of this, and, and the lower part here was a clump of material that looked consistent with painter's tape. There's, you can tell the blue tape right here, and you'll see better pictures of it during the evidence. Blue painter's tape, a clump of blue, blue painter's tape. Summer's, uh, essentially the pieces of Summer's skull, it placed them together and realized that she had multiple jaw fractures. She's been hit in the front of her face, fracturing her jaw in several places. She was also struck in the back of the head and in the front of the head numerous times. Joseph McStay Sr. was, again, entombed in this woven type material. He was the most preserved of the bodies. Here's a view of his lower body. You'll see his lower legs uh, are bleached white from outside of the grave. Behind his head was this extension cord that was knotted. Joseph McStay had a fracture that you can see here in the middle of the photograph. You can also see to the left the red tie-down strap and the electrical cord. On the back of his head was a clear uh, impact site for blunt force trauma on the back right of his head. He also had them on the back left, on the front, as well as the ribs. And the, uh, so here's a view of the left side of his head in the back, the fracture, as well as his uh, tibia, the shin bone on the lower left leg had been fractured as well. Likely from a strike, consistent with a strike from the front and the bone breaks towards the back. All four members of the McStay family were killed by blunt force trauma to the head. So, San Bernardino County sheriffs took over the investigation because the bodies were located in San Bernardino County. <coughs> they began work. Um, essentially, they formed a team made up of individuals from other, another homicide team, and they were placed on this case to investigate only this case. And they did it for over a year. And they learned some interesting things about what had occurred on the 1st through the 3rd of February. They obtained Joseph's QuickBooks records. Now, if you're not familiar with QuickBooks, you will be by the end of this. QuickBooks is a uh, online, basically, ledger. You can create checks, you can create invoices, um, you can add cash payments, you can do all sorts of things, and it shows up on a ledger. Um, Joseph had two, essentially, two QuickBooks accounts that were associated with each other. One for the prefabricated um, fountains, one for the custom fountains. The custom fountains was relatively new. <coughs> there aren't a whole lot of entries, but it's been going on for about a year, year or two, on the custom side. And, and the prefabricated side went on a lot longer. Obviously, they looked at Joseph QuickBooks records, and what they found was on February 1st, his QuickBooks was accessed. 
Remember during the course of the defendant's interview when he said, Joseph brought me checks, and I said, wait a minute, three days earlier he was already writing checks. This was what they found. They found that within 30, 24, within 42 minutes of receiving that email from Joseph that, hey, I've overpaid you $42,000, $845. Within 45 minutes, within that next hour, Joseph's records were... Uh, QuickBooks was accessed <clears throat> at 12.24 p.m. on February 1st. And this was not done from any of the computers seized from the mixed day records. A vendor was added, Charles Merritt, all lowercase. Joseph McStay, when he entered a business or a person, would always capitalize the first letter properly of the word. Charles Merritt was added as a vendor on 12.24 on February 1st. What's also interesting is that for a person familiar with the program, they would know that Charles Merritt, properly capitalized, was already a vendor and would simply be a pull down menu. A pull down entry into the, into the records. A check was created at 1234 for $2,500 to Charles Merritt. Another check was created on February 1st for $2,500 to Charles Merritt at 1237. The second check was printed and then deleted. Now what happens when you delete a check on QuickBooks is it won't show up on the ledger. So if you deleted the check, it's not gonna show up check number blah, blah, blah. What it will show is in the account activity that all of this activity happened. That check was printed and delete it. The first check that, he, that was created was numbered 4093. The second check was numbered 4092. This one was for $2,500. That check was deleted. Neither of those checks were cashed or deposited. But the next day, someone logs in to Joseph's QuickBooks accounts, to EIP's QuickBooks accounts. It's not on for many of the mixed days computers. And two checks are added to guess who? Charles Merritt. Printed and deleted. On the custom side of the count, Joseph had never deleted a check. Not only did he properly cap capitalize names, he had never deleted a check. But on February 2nd, on the custom account, checks were deleted. That was a check for zero dollars. That check was printed, then it was deleted, and then there was another check for $2,495. That check was printed and deleted. And that same day, February 2nd, was cashed at Union Bank. This is the check here in the lower half. Now, what's interesting about that is the date, February 2nd, that it was cashed at Union Bank. Deposit here, SA, might mean Saudi Arabia. I should back up. They had a project. They were going to build a fountain in Saudi Arabia. All lowercase on the Charles Merritt. <clears throat> what's interesting is on that same date, February 2nd, that's the date that MacGyver was at the house helping them paint, if you'll recall. And he left on February 2nd, and he couldn't come back until, no, he left on February 3rd, and he couldn't come back to the 6th. And just Summer got mad. He'll tell you. She was mad. Um, he kept asking her, and that's when he realized they're not contacting me back. She must really be mad or something happened. But in any event, he was there on the 2nd, and he on the 2nd. Joseph gave Charles Merritt a handwritten check for $100. Not a handwritten check for $2,595, but a handwritten check on February 2nd for $100. That was deposited into a bank account that was created on February 3rd by, for, by Charles Merritt. The large check, all lowercase Charles Merritt, was cashed. February 4th is the last day, um, you know, the, the next days were heard from. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is take kind of an analysis of 
both QuickBooks, other evidence, including cell phones. You're going to hear from Kevin Bowles. Kevin Bowles is a special agent with the FBI. He has worked previously on their fugitive task force. When someone runs from the law and they have a cell phone, he would work on locating them based on their cell phone records. And he's done a lot of work in this area. So those records were given to him, those being Joseph's cell phone records and the defendant's cell phone records, were given to Kevin Bowles for an analysis. <coughs> what he found was that on February 4th at 1151, uh, Joseph calls a number, 949-492-8090, that is associated with Joseph's bank in San Clemente, the Union Bank in San Clemente. He doesn't call that number all that often. He has called it in the past, around the time they were buying the house, they were moving in. Um, he doesn't call it all that often. Um, a few minutes later, he calls the phone number associated with the defendant, 3740102. Two minutes later, he calls the defendant. After that, 11.56, he signs into his QuickBooks and then signs out two minutes later. At this point, that February check, second check has cleared the bank. After he logs out of QuickBooks, and not having seen the check because it was deleted on the ledger, again calls his bank at 12.15. That's a different number, same bank. While he's doing this, He's traveling 15 northbound in uh, the general area of, of Lake Elsinore. He arrives in the Rancho Cucamonga area, and he's, his cell phone is communicating with towers in the Rancho Cucamonga area at 12.52. There's a call to the defendant. At 101, there's another call to the defendant. <clears throat> and at 3.03 is the last time that his phone um, makes contact with that tower in Rancho Cucamonga. This was the day of the meeting at Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A is in that general area. However, Joseph's internet access during that two-hour period uh, is almost constant. Internet access on his phone. After the 1252 phone call to the defendant, between 12.52 and 1.01, there are 13 frantic phone calls, primarily from the defendant to his, who he called his wife. It was actually his girlfriend, Catherine Jarvis. She lived with him there in Rancho Cucamonga. And if you'll notice, there's a call at 12.52, 12.54, another one at 12.54, 12.55, 12.56, 12.57, another one at 12.57, 12.58, 12.59, and finally, she calls him back at 1. That's all in a period of nine minutes. Between 3.03 .03 p.m. and 3.07 p.m., if there was a meeting, it would be after the meeting, Joseph calls the defendant seven times during that time period. The longest call lasting two minutes and 37 seconds was at 5.48 p.m. that night. His phone, Joseph's phone, is again traveling southbound back home. That 5.48 phone call, he's in the Fallbrook area when he makes that phone call. 5.48 p.m. After that 5.48 p.m. contact with the defendant, the defendant's cell phone goes off the grid. And that is to say it's either turned off, it's in airplane mode, or it's somewhere where it's not connecting with any towers. From 5.48 p.m. on February 4th to 9.32 p.m., his cell phone is not connecting any towers. And there are, during that time period, one, two, three, four, five calls between 6.09 and 9.04 and from Catherine Jarvis, his wife at the time, to the defendant. And... Um, Voicemail messages are left. Now, the way we know that, just looking at the records, you'll, you'll also know a lot about cell phones at the end of this trial, um, is that this is, gives the geographic location as well as other information for the cell towers that his phone was connecting with. For, during that time period, during those calls that he was getting from his wife, Catherine Jarvis, he's not connecting with any tower.
It's actually more than three and a half hour period. All co incoming calls appear to be forwarded to voicemail. At 9.32 p.m., he calls Catherine Jar Jarvis, and he, his cell phone connects with a tower in Mira Loma, which is south of Rancho Cucamonga, north of Corona. After 9.32, after that 9.32 p.m. contact, his phone is off the grid until 7.30 the next morning, February 5th. <clears throat> During that 5.32 to 9.48 p.m. is when the Mitchley video was taken, 7.47 p.m. A look into Joseph's QuickBooks records showed, you're going to hear evidence about the, you're going to hear more evidence about the, that video in particular. During that time period, at 7.56 p.m., someone signed in from the mixed day's home computer, the one there at Joseph's desk, signed in, added a check to Charles Merritt, all lowercase, deleted the check, and signed up. The memo was for Paul Mitchell, all lowercase, and the check was for $4,000. At 8.28 p.m., Joseph's cell phone record shows a call to the defendant. Again, during that time period when the defendant's cell phone is off. The defendant's cell phone does not register a call during that time period. Could be explained by quickly trying to call someone and hanging up before the connection's made from the closest tower to you to the closest tower to them. Before that connection's made, you're calling and hanging up. On February 5th, four checks are created. Not from the mixed day's home computer. Computers, any of them. Check 40, 94, 95, 96, and 97 are all created. Two of them are to Metro Sheet Metal, that company in Azusa, for relatively small amounts. Two of them are to Charles Merritt, all lowercase. Now, what's interesting about these four checks on the 5th, they were backdated to the 4th, the last day the family was known to be alive. The sequence of checks is before the checks that were found in Joseph's office out in the open on a chair. That check was printed, 4093, it's kind of hard to read, I apologize. Um, the number was deleted, it was edited, it was to be printed, it was printed, 4095. It was backdated to February 4th, 2010. One check, 4097 for $6,506, and one check, 4098 for $2,350, that check was deposited. The $6,500 one that was written on that date was not deposited or cashed. They were all created backdated and deleted. On that date, February 5th, this is the day after the last known contact with the family, it's a Friday, from 3.54 p.m. to 9.17 p.m., the defendant's cell phone again is not connecting into any towers. There's no activity on his cell phone. And then after that 9.18 p.m., I believe there's no more contact in as well. So that's Friday the 5th. I'm going to jump forward to the 8th, and then we're going to come back, and it'll make sense when I do it, I promise. On February 8th, that's the day the trooper was towed from the lot in San Ysidro. From 726 to 131 a.m., at 726, the defendant has a cell phone connection to a tower in Rancho. After that, his cell phone is not receiving or sending any messages, so it's either turned off in airplane mode or um, not connecting with any towers from 7.26 a.m. to 1.31 p.m. That vehicle, again, that's on the date the vehicle was towed at 11 o'clock that night. Backing up to the interview with San Diego, he was asked, have you ever driven the vehicle? That is Suzu Trooper. Yeah. When the last 
the last time I was in it, we went to Camp Pendleton. Went to, we played paintball. Camp Pendleton. San Diego, while they were with uh, the defendant there, took what's called a buckle swab. It's a swab of his, the inside of his cheek for his DNA. Um, when the bodies were located, San Diego, I'm sorry, San Bernardino, um, processed the swab for DNA. Just kind of thumbnail sketch what DNA does. Everyone has a profile. They look at various areas on the DNA strand, and everybody has a value at those areas. Um, and across the population, there's certain statistics for, for instance, I might be a 1-2 at this location, but half the population is a 1-2 at that location. But every other location also has its own statistical value. So they obtained a known sample, that being Charles Merritt, and they obtained a profile from the steering wheel of the Isuzu Trooper. The swab's taken by San Diego County, by Dennis Williams. They compare the values of the locations of the known sample with the values of the locations uh, on the steering wheel from the swaps from the steering wheel. They were able to obtain a mixture of individuals on the steering wheel. The mixture, when you look at the quantity or the amount of DNA, was primarily Joseph, because he was the driver. It matched him. Uh, there was a trace, a small contributor of Summer, and a minor contributor of the defendant. The possibility of finding that profile at random in the population is 1 in 850 million. <coughs> They didn't get any uh, <clears throat> results from the driver's side panel. Uh, they got some results. The numbers are um, not 1 in 850 million, but there is some um, suggestion on the gear shift and on the uh, radio controls, air conditioning controls in the panel in the trooper. On February 8th, Again, that's the day the troopers found. At 1.31, when the cell phone, the defendant's cell phone comes back on the grid, so to speak, <coughs> comes on at 1.31, he's uh, near, near the 91 freeway in the Corona area, and then at 1.41, there's a cell phone, a tower contacted on the northbound 15 in the Corona Norco, Norco area. 1.51, he's even farther north, and 1.54 to 6.31, he's accessing or, or signaling sending a signal to the towers near his residence. On that date, February 8th, Monday, guess what? QuickBooks is accessed. At 2.15 p.m., sorry, at 2.20 p.m., a check is added to Charles Merritt, all lowercase. That check's deleted. There is a 107-minute phone to call to QuickBooks on Monday the 8th. The caller identified himself as Joseph McStay. The number he was calling from was the defendant's phone number. Uh, there was some indication of canceling a subscription, getting a new version. He tells San Diego investigators, Joseph gave me his credit card number, even though we're two different companies and I don't even do all of his fountains, gave me his credit card number to get a new version of QuickBooks. The check to Charles Merritt was created. It was backdated to February 4th, printed and deleted, and it was deposited on February 9th, 2010. The two checks to Metro Sheet Metal that were written on the 5th and backdated to the 4th, those were held on until March by the bookkeeper because they didn't look right. It wasn't like what she'd gotten from Joseph in the past. It's just the transaction history. On February 9th, again, someone calls QuickBooks, claiming to be Joseph McStay, but calling from the defendant's cell phone number. Customer service representative who took the call said that the customer was adamant that they needed all of the information in the QuickBooks account deleted. 
In fact, he knows they were adamant because in his customer service notes, he wrote in all caps, NEEDS. All of the information deleted. So he told Mr. McStay, calling from the defendant's cell phone, uh, I need to send you an email as the administrator with what you need to do, the steps you need to take to do that. He didn't hear anything. He sent another email. He still didn't hear anything. And he closed closed. February 9th, the defendant goes to Susan Blake's house. It's Tuesday, February 9th. Says, hey, I can't get a hold of your son, Joe. You, you know anything? I don't know. I'm going to go down there. And his cell phone goes down there and it accesses towers in the Fallbrook area for about an hour and a half. And then after that, it accesses towers uh, near the Paula Casino for about eight hours. Remember how I said early on that the playing the victim and the, all of that? That came to light kind of in light of his interview with San Diego County. If Joseph doesn't get packed pretty soon, uh, the rent won't get paid. Well, oh, that's not going to be fun. Uh, Joseph doesn't get paid. That was on for He takes out $500 at the Samuel Casino in Highland. The next day, he takes out $300 at the San Manuel Casino in Highland. But two weeks later, he takes out $500 at the Commerce Casino. Same day, he takes out another $500 from, the, from near the Commerce Casino. After that, another $500 from the San Manuel Casino. But he's talking about this impact that it's going to have on his life. And he's, you know, his wife, she's worried too because... Joseph was the primary source of iDesign's income. When do, you, when do you think we'll be getting any money? Like, uh, uh, I don't know. We'll go back to February 6th. February 6th was a Saturday. And 1.30 p.m., the defendant is contacting towers. Remember earlier on I said over to the right, here's the geographical location of those towers. Those were, again, analyzed by Kevin Bowles of the FBI. And he can look at the location and the azimuth, that is the direction cell towers go, certain sectors. There's a sector for a certain number of degrees. That's what the cell phone contacts off of. Uh, between 10.46 a.m. and 1.30 p.m., the defendant's cell phone is contacting towers in the... In particular, 11.30 a.m. to 11.52 and 1.30 p.m., he's on a tower, he's contacting a tower, which is on top of this mountain here on, on the right of this photograph. Here's a photograph of that cell tower from the grave site. Two days after the family was murdered. Ladies and gentlemen, um, we talked a little bit about in jury selection, or Mr. Imes talked to you about unanswered questions. Uh, there will be some in this case. Um, we can't tell uh, whether or not someone helped the defendant, either during the commission of the crime or after. Certainly, it suggests two grown people need to be moved. We can't answer all of the questions. We can't answer the who. Who's ripping off his best friend and got caught.
And we can tell you that the evidence is going to show in this case that the only person in this case that's associated with the McStays that had a connection to the high desert was the defendant. Everyone else is San Diego County, Riverside County, Orange County. The only connection to the high desert in this case is that man right there. We can tell you the how, we can tell you the why, and we can tell you the who. At the end of this case, we're going to give a closing argument. We're going to ask you to find him guilty and to hold him accountable. Thank you.